Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Angie, I remember now. The winner of the year was Hesperia Gales. No idle talk. You'll crash, Dingo. In the final 30 seconds, Henry G trashed out from field out. Man, we had a great time that night. 20 to touchdown. Can't wait for the new season. Good morning. Ready for combat operation. This is Orbital Frame Jehuti. Do you want me to explain how to manipulate the frame? Hello, Matt. This is Peter Bartow from San Francisco uh, trying to get a hold of you. I wanted to let you know that uh, Zone of the Enders, the second runner, a game I did about 4,000 years ago, is being re-released, and I'm desperate for some press. So I'm thinking uh, maybe you're the right guy to talk to. Give me a call when you can. On the line, we have Peter Bartow talking to us from where are you talking to us from, Peter? I am currently in San Francisco, the beautiful city of San Francisco. I have never been. Is it any good? It's a gorgeous place. Uh, a lot of good food, great things to see. Uh, it's got its own set of problems right now, but uh, you can see past those, I'm sure. Now, Peter, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be wrong, actually. Obviously, nowadays, you know, Los Angeles, Toronto, you know, Montreal, they're known as sort of the video game parts of the world maybe right didn't san francisco used to be the same thing in the 90s you know and, and even now i mean there's still a fairly vibrant gaming opportunities here for voice actors not as much as los angeles and from what i've heard toronto especially but san francisco especially with uh, some of the independent gaming companies when when i first started doing this in the uh, late 90s in the 20th century i would basically to get my name out there i'd I'd basically look at some of these independent gaming companies, these developers that were probably working in their garage on old computer systems trying to, you know, get these things up and running. And I would try to just get work. I had a demo and I'd send it to them. And, and uh, over 50 emails, maybe I'd get two responses, which was great. But the one thing, the holy grail at the time was uh, LucasArts. George Lucas's gaming company was here uh, in the Bay Area. And so I think me and any other kind of voice actor that was trying to get to the big time that was the grail so i never got anything from lucas i ended up doing some work for telltale studios which came out of lucas but that's a whole different story but there is opportunity here um i think like you said i think los angeles really is the hot if you want to get work for gaming i think you got to be in la or just be really dialed in to uh to be able to you know do it virtually from there peter yes sir Unfortunately, I never get breaking news on these podcasts. So you are finding this out literally at the same time I am. Burt Reynolds, start of Smokey and the Bandit, Deliverance and The Longest Yard, has died at the age of 82. Oh, Burt Reynolds? Yep. Oh, no. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I heard he was just cast in the new... Oh, God, it was a, um, what's his bucket, a uh, new movie that was coming out about uh, about Charles Manson, believe it or not. Um, I wonder if you made it to, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear that. I always liked him uh, in those old movies. So there you go, Peter, you've got some sort of accolade on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right off TMZ. Where do you go from Burt Reynolds' death? What do we do here? Yeah. I'll let you direct. Right, we'll, we'll go back to what we were talking about. Yeah, as you were saying, obviously the, the olden gaming companies, obviously as you mentioned, LucasArts and Telltale Games, were obviously big, big hits in the 90s. By this point, Konami had made Metal Gear Solid, which had been obviously a huge hit, and then they made Zone of the Enders, which was the first one. And then in 2003, Peter, in 2003, 15 years ago, they made Zone of the Enders the second runner. Yes, they did. And somehow, <laughs> lo and behold, <laughs> Peter... It's been re-released on the PlayStation 4, I believe, within the next month, if not next week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. I uh, hadn't heard anything about that game in, you know, a little bit less than 15 years. But uh, it's it's nice to see it's getting its second go-around. 
and then uh, hopefully I'll get more hate mail, <laughs> or hopefully I will not get more hate mail. We had some interesting, which I can tell you about, some interesting uh, reaction to the um, to the project as, as voice actors and how the whole thing went down. Uh, it was kind of interesting. But if you'd like, I can tell you about the evolution of the of how we got involved with that game. Tell us everything, Peter. That's why you're here. <laughs> you got it. So um, I got into the voice acting in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, and there was another Japanese game developer, Koei Games, that had connected with uh, some little San Francisco operation that was doing the English uh, localization for them. And I had connected with this guy that was running that, and uh, they were doing a series called The Dynasty Warriors, uh, which was this, these games that were pretty bizarre. Anyway, I was able to land a bunch of voice acting on those. Those, again, were not the best received because, you know, I think I did a fairly good job, but then they were getting people just off the street to... Uh, fill in voices, and so it was amateurist at best. But uh, but through that, I met a woman named uh, Janice Lee. Janice was casting for various games, uh, voice talent for various games at the time, and she contacted me about Zone of the Enders, uh, the second runner. And sometime, I think it was in 2002, I came in to audition for various roles. I think we were reading for different stuff, and uh, I ended up getting the the vaunted role of the well named Dingo Egret who uh, is the main character uh, in that movie. I wasn't familiar with the, you know, with, with Zone of the Enders. I wasn't familiar with uh, Kojima or Metal Gear, really. But, uh, yeah, so I got the gig, and we ended up uh, recording in a uh, studio called Annex Digital, which is south of, south of here, down in Silicon Valley. And we were guided and directed by a team that came over from Konami, from Japan. And one of the things that me and the, the other actors were having a little bit of a problem with, and we tried to do what we can, uh, was they were adamant that we use the exact uh, English translation that they had for both the uh, lip syncing, you know, for the various cinematics, as well as for the, you know, the off-screen stuff. Some of it was very awkward. It was like you ran it through a bad Google Translate. It was, again, awkward at best, sometimes completely nonsensical. But they wanted us to really stick to the script, no matter what was there. And, you know, the, the lip syncing part was, was fun and very challenging. But again, due to the translation issues and trying to make the, the dialogue stick to the, to the animated lips, we were all over the board at times. And it was a, a little frustrating. I'm not a gamer, but looking at reviews afterwards, they were just trashing the voice acting. And it was frustrating. You know, I know me and, and the other actors would say, hey, we were stuck. We had to read what was there. But, you know, I also did get some fan mail, which my daughters thought was hysterical. We had sessions for weeks. It was a lot of copy. It was a, it was a fun project. I thought it came out well, uh, all things considered. Mm -hmm. Well, I've obviously got a fast track 15 years forward to now. Okay. I've got to tell the listener what is going on with this, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I unfortunately am a gamer, Peter. So, obviously, I looked on the PlayStation system, and you can actually download a demo of this. And I thought, really? They're re-releasing it after 15 years? And, uh, yeah, so I did. And this is where sort of it goes a bit weird for sort of our time, I suppose, Peter, uh, is that they're including this VR in it. Yeah, that's going to be quite interesting. People can uh, get air sick while listening to my voice in their head, I'm assuming. If they'd had that technology 15 years ago, sort of like your VRs, your motion capture, would it have helped, maybe? I don't know. Well, as far as the production of this particular game, I think when you use VR, personally, that you'd probably cut out a lot of the whole cinematics thing, the cutscenes um, that I know a lot of games use to move the narrative forward, because all of a sudden you're not linear anymore. You're, what, you're spatial. You know, it's all over the board. I'm going to suggest something, Peter. Yes, sir. Do you think that some certain publisher is thinking, hmm, if we get this back into the um, public eye again, we might make a third one, maybe. I don't know. In fact, my friend Janice, who had cast this before, she had told me that way back when that they were thinking about making uh, another one at the time, you know, probably what, the mid-2000s. But I guess uh, they didn't get the sales. The game itself was, I guess, reviewed positively for the most part, except for, like I said, some of the voice acting. But uh, for whatever reason, it didn't sell. Maybe it was a game before its time. So I guess nothing ever happened with it. I guess I'd also read or heard from her that there were some issues between the publisher and the producer. <clears throat> and I don't know whether he's, he might have taken his game elsewhere at that point. But uh, 
hey, you never know, Dingo, if he's uh, he's still alive, I can still do Dingo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Peter, I do have to um, obviously touch on the other thing as well. Computer games being turned into movies. Mm. Could they do it? Who would I mean, who would play you? Who would play me, yeah. Um, somebody a lot younger, obviously, and somebody with a nice full head of silver white hair, uh, which I do not have. And uh, as far as turning something like that into a movie, it seems like, you know, with, with anything, especially with these kind of huge mechanicals, the mythology... And the, the storyline, they're so kind of so deep. You'd have to just tell this huge introduction to get people just up to speed where they can understand the thing. It'd be considerably difficult to make a intelligible film out of this kind of game, I think. That's just my perspective. Well, I was thinking Top Gun. Top Gun, well, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, you could simplify the hell out of it, I guess. Yeah, then Tom Cruise could play Dingo Egret. That makes sense. He could dye his hair. I was thinking of that other guy. I can't remember what his name is. Oh, yeah, Val Kilmer. No, not him. Not Val Kilmer. No, no, no. <laughs> no, the one who's in La La Land. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryan, what's his bucket? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. He could play me. I don't know if they keep the name, though. The Dingo Egret thing, taking two animals and, and ramming them together like that was kind of a strange construct. I'm not really sure where they got that, but uh, I will always think fondly of Dingo Egret. <laughs> Oh, I just love the 90s. I love the yeah. 2000s because it was just so simple back then. I did a bunch of goofy games back, you know, those Dynasty Warriors game. I did Clue Finders for, jeez, uh, I don't forget the publisher. I did all these kind of silly games that were, they were a lot simpler back then, that's for sure. And the best part is, is that you didn't have the competition, I suppose, in that, that time. Exactly. It's It's tough, you know, I... I don't. Uh, I don't get as much game work now. Um, you know, I've done a few over the last few years, but it's uh, it's tough. The ease of recording from home or a virtual or a recording studio, you know, for, from thousands of miles away, is uh, is has really kind of diluted the talent. So, you know, there's there's a lot of actors out there that are better than I am, and and all they have to do is get in front of me with the auditions, and they they get them. So, um, so it is a little more difficult. I uh, produced a game for an Australian developer in the late 90s, early 2000s called Submarine Titans. And that was just horrific because it's, uh, sending files back then wasn't easy uh, to Australia from here. It wasn't as just zipping up things. But the, the actual production was, was really fun, simple, campy to the most part. You know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is, obviously, if we're going to go back to the 90s, 2000s, I mean, obviously, you, you mentioned about sending files to Australia. Obviously, you got dial up, haven't you? You haven't got broadband and. Yeah, no, we were we were. In fact, memory serves. We were like burning. Uh, we were FedExing things, audio files that we'd have to burn to disc and things like that. There was a lot of steps involved back then. Let's talk a bit about you, Peter. What made you want to be a voice over artist in the first place? Uh, it's one of those things where you know the old joke face for radio. But also, uh, it was interesting, you, you know, you get enough people telling you, you know, you've got a nice voice and you should use it for something. And I, I didn't get into it until well after I was married. And I took a class at a junior college that uh, quickly went from 50 people in the classroom to five because everybody there was told that they had a nice voice. But once they realized they had to get up in front of people and act, they, they pretty much uh, kind of freaked them all out. and They all split. But uh I met a good friend that way who was a producer at the time. He helped me with my demo, and uh, that's when I just started sending emails to the develop. Like I said, just finding you know local groups that were doing you know were doing a game on Craigslist or whatever was the like Craigslist back then, uh, which is one of the local posting things. And I would occasionally get some work, and it kind of took off from there and got an agent, uh, Stars Agency here in the city, which have been great. And for the games. Like you said, there's a lot. There's a lot of opportunity out there. It's um, finding uh, a way in which to get to the top of the heap. I've had some really fun games I worked on the Telltale Sam and Max series. I do the NBA 2K, which is a which is a big sports title. I do that every. I've done that every year for 14 years as the uh, PA announcer. Then I do a few other things. I did a Dothraki for the Game of Thrones Conquest recently, and a Berserker for Davillion, which was a Tryon game. I'd like to get more game work. It's uh, it's just kind of finding the opportunity. Oddly, I had a conversation with someone the other day, and we were talking about the death 
of radio drama. Yeah, you know, in fact, I've got a good friend that wanted to kind of jumpstart in podcasts like like this is mm. um, that type of stuff, kind of a serial story thing using recurring actors and new actors. It's almost like uh, with a Lake Wobegon tales, that type of thing. I'm just thinking. I mean, not much emphasis is really put on on the old the old favourites like yourself, Peter. Nowadays, it's it's more sort of focused on getting A-list actors in to do it. <laughs> yeah, one of the questions I always get considered. I, mean, I live very close to where all the you know where Pixar studios, and so oh, do you get any work from Pixar? It's like nobody gets any work from Pixar. You know, that's a that's a that's an LA or a, like you said, it's an A-list actor thing, and I get it. Um, and some of them are tremendous voice actors. There have been some uh, animated films from like Disney that I thought they just stuck names on there. The, the actor themselves didn't bring anything to the part, but that could be sour grapes talking. I don't know, but yeah, that's a that's an uphill battle. I mean, that's that's never going to get over that one unless I become an A list actor. You never know, Peter. <laughs> the day is young. I suppose. I mean, with regards to obviously your acting career, I do have to obviously touch on Sam and Max because if I don't, then the people who like Sam and Max are probably going to complain to me personally sure. that I didn't <laughs> mention it. What was it like working on on that? that game and obviously the, the series itself oh that was a ball that was that was uh, that was one of the most fun projects i've ever been involved with number one the recording studio that they did them all uh was right down the street from my house so that made things really easy telltale was a bunch of ex for the most part a bunch of ex lucas arts guys who had a lot of experience in in doing games that particular game the whole storyline i thought it was very intelligent the, the writers wrote very intelligent and funny it was great. Jory Prum, uh, the late Jory Prum, he was a great guy. He was the engineer who, who uh, engineered all these, uh, these the Sam Max games with the Bay Area Sound guys. We did, gosh, we did three years, I think, uh, three different years with five episodes or six episodes in each. And it was, it was fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Really goofy characters all over the board. I did three or four characters that were all very different, and uh, yeah, it was great. And, of course, I do have to mention that Telltale Games did Monkey Island. They did do Monkey Island. Yeah. In fact, that's, that's, that's the game I, uh, way back when, I was able to audition for back when I was first starting out, but did not get the role. But uh, I did get the roles with uh, Sam and Max, so that was nice. Mm-hmm. This is going to be a fun one, Peter. I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> what advice would you give to anyone wanting to get into voiceover artists? Well, I get this a lot, and... You know, the most important part, I learned this the hard way, is is you got to take the word voice out of it and just become an actor. You've got to be very comfortable. It's not just uh, hidden behind a microphone. You've really got to get into it. And it sounds simple. It really isn't. You know, I started out by, I did a lot of free stuff. I'd volunteer for, like, student films if they needed a narrator. I mean, I needed to get a, a reel together, you know. And uh, so it's finding that kind of stuff, which I don't know how available that is these days. There's a lot of classes. There's a lot of, you know, comedy just basically uh, getting out there and doing comedy and stuff like that. Being very comfortable, making yourself look like an idiot um, is kind of the basically way it works for me. I had no qualms about people looking at me going, why is that guy talking in a high-pitched voice, sh- shrieking, you know? But that's what the role called for. So so I think it's that. It's acting classes and getting very comfortable doing acting, and then the voice stuff will come with it. Mm. Now, obviously, you would have had to have gone to conventions because of the projects you've done? I have never been to a convention. Wow, would you? You know, even though I mentioned I'm not a gamer, I'm, I'm definitely a nerd in a lot of ways. I love, uh, uh, you know, animation, sci-fi, um, all that kind of stuff. And I always thought it'd be kind of a fun, uh, that whole culture would be a lot of fun to, to you know, investigate, be a part of. Mm. Uh, but I, yeah, I've never been, never had the opportunity. Someone got me into cosplay. <laughs> I'm just thinking if anyone's ever done a dingo, a dingo cosplay. That would be very interesting to see, especially just the hair. You know, very pale gray skin or bluish skin or whatever he's got, and then uh, and then this 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 great shock of white hair. That's that's the beautiful thing. Mm. Well, <laughs> talking about spare time, Peter, because I kind of <laughs> did have a look at your website. People always say, oh, they're actors, you know, they, they just act and then they don't do anything afterwards. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you do quite a lot. <laughs> I do. I keep myself busy. 
I do a lot of different things. In fact, for voice stuff, I'm actually getting into doing some casting now, too, with a digital media company here in the Bay Area, which is kind of fun. If the role's not right for me, I then try to find the right person for it. I'm just going to poke you, Peter. Sure. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Poke you with my stick. The reason why I'm, I'm, I'm sort of following this up is because it's sort of more charity work, I suppose, would be the term. I'm a huge wildlife buff. I'm a field researcher for, here you go, here's obscure. I do field research for a local group uh, that's studying our Bay Area, Northern American river otter population. So there you go. Through that, I've learned how to set up uh, what they call, uh, it's trail cameras. It's basically doing camera trapping. You're trying to find out populations of animals in certain areas and genetic testing and things like that. And through that, my family does a lot of work for a uh, Kenya-based girls' school called the Daraja Academy. And I started at the Daraja Wildlife Project, which was teaching the girls over there how to set up camera traps to learn more about the animals in just that they're in East Africa. They're on their campus. Uh, as a way in which they can, A, learn about the animals, the wildlife there, but also as a potential career path for them. And I also uh, co-founded a group called Jeepney Projects Worldwide. We support uh, both endangered birds and the conservation groups all over the world that are doing work to save these endangered birds. So there you go. Mm, mm. Well, Peter, people have said to me that we, we sort of sort of set up the interview, so you know what questions I'm going to ask. I don't know what question you're no. asking. <laughs> now, now, to prove it's not true, because I'm going to ask Peter this question. I apologise, Peter, but I've okay. done this for 10 years now, and I've never asked this question to somebody who's a, who's a um, field researcher. Okay. <laughs> what is the otter population of San Francisco like? That's a damn good question. And for San Francisco alone, it's pretty much less than five in the city of San Francisco. But if you get into the San Francisco Bay Area in general, we're talking, we're, we're getting some good numbers. Not to get too far off topic, but this is basically an animal that was native to our area back in the early 20th century, extirpated due to bad water and hunting, came back on its own volition in the early 21st century, and now we've got a fairly, very sustainable population. But in the Bay Area in general, you know, we're, we're pushing close to, I would say, 75 plus otters. And these are river otters, by the way. So there you go. Well, I was thinking it was going to be thousands. <laughs> no, not yet. No, no. But uh, we're, we're, we're heading the right direction. Good, healthy population. We don't know. Part of it's, it's because the way these animals are built, you can't put collars on them. They have no neck. And so uh, we do all our, uh, you're going to love this, we collect otter scat, which is their poop, and a jelly they excrete and get DNA from there to figure out the markers in which to make a, a, an individual uh, otter. And then we can figure out whether, hey, this otter was seen on this day here, and then, you know, maybe miles away two weeks later. That's the only way we can really check their distribution. Is this more than you asked, than you wanted to know? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking you've turned into Jeff Goldblum or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I could blather on about river otters all day. Have you named them? We'll, we'll get into that at some point. We're going to have people so they can support, you know, they can name one if they do a donation to our... Uh, to our group, the River Otter Ecology Project. So, name the otter. I mean, can you, like, watch it? Are you guys thinking of, like, doing videos and live cameras or something? I don't know. You can go to riverotterecology.org and you can see a whole bunch of otter videos. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're great animals. They're, they're basically indicator species. They basically show that if they're there, the water's clean. And that's a good thing. Oh, damn. Oh, which makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question for you. I mean, obviously, voice acting, you know, that's obviously important to you. How important is ecology to you? It's it's the most important. If I have any kind of a legacy to leave this world, which sounds kind of silly maybe, but it would be to uh, have benefited through conservation efforts or whatever, or you know, teaching these, these Kenyan girls how to basically become researchers themselves. Hmm. I mean, it's obviously not helping with certain <laughs> precedents in the way. <laughs> I have no idea what you're speaking of. No. <laughs> By the way, the Sam and Max series, I think, were very prescient because they had a lot of Trump-like characters in there. So, you know, props to Telltale for kind of seeing the future. Oh, dystopian future, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a good future. <laughs> well, the other thing I do want to sort of quickly gloss over is the fact you're writing a couple of books. Yeah, you know, uh, one of them is 
is, you know, you're talking earlier about translating a game like Zone of the Enders to a movie. I've been writing a book called Damon Nomad, which is a bizarre sci-fi fantasy, completely off the rails, uh, written by a 13-year-old person with too much, you know, poop jokes in their mind. Uh, I'm about two-thirds of the way through it. I don't know whether anything will ever happen to it. But if you ever see, years from now, a book by me called Damon Nomad, you heard about it here first. I technically thought you were going to write some sort of journal on the activities of the otter in 2018 or something like that, you know. No. no. The other book, it's basically a coffee table book on the historic drinking establishments of the United States, like a celebration of the great bars, the historic bars. That's one of my favorite things to do is go find an old bar and drink in it. This is just getting weird now, Peter. Yeah, yeah. I can... <laughs> <laughs> what turned from Zone of the Enders went to Otters and now it's going to Drinking Establishment. <laughs> With this Drinking Establishment book, tell me tell me a bit more about it because it does sound quite interesting. Oh, it's great. I mean, especially uh, there, I'm assuming you're in, the, uh, you're in England somewhere. When I was there years ago, my first time, I just fell in love with old pubs and the whole idea, I studied history in college and I guess got kind of tied in the whole idea of these places where for years, all these businesses around come and go, but these pubs or these old bars or taverns would stay there and, and basically be the uh, location for exchange of information and watershed events were happening all over the world and people would go there and drink. And some of these places are hundreds and hundreds and almost thousands of years old or 8,000 years old. And that really stuck with me that, that there could be a business like that that could be, you know, basically a door, some chairs, a table, and a bar that people would go in and drink for over and over again for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think I think that's the whole longevity of that sh- shows something. I don't know what that thing is, but it was interesting to me. And so I started visiting old bars all over the world and uh, got the idea to uh, do this, you know, evocative photographs and tales of these old bars and some of the adventures and crazy things that happen inside their walls. Mm. So going, going with that then, what's, what's the worst one you've heard about? The worst bar? Mm. Well, when I say worst, I mean sort of like what's the worst story you've heard? Those bars are no longer with us. There was basically places here in San Francisco along what they call the Barbary Coast. They did a lot of nasty things. They would basically hang up a shingle, put a keg of beer in there, and then... Uh, uh, bring in some animals and, and some drunk people and uh, let your imagination do the rest of it. But those are thankfully all gone. <laughs> so they did, they did not stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. Well, what's your favorite bar then, Peter? There you go. My favorite bar here in the States is probably a, an old bar in New York City called McSorley's. In fact, I'll be there in a couple weeks. It's uh, It's been around since the mid-19th century. It's like an old, comfortable old chair, and the history of it is remarkable. Apparently, Abe Lincoln once had a beer there. I highly recommend it. It's in the Bowery uh, area in New York City, Manhattan. Wonderful, wonderful bar. That's probably my favorite. With regards to tipple, what's your tipple? I'm sorry? What's your tipple? My, what do I drink? Yeah. Ah, well, I'm all over the board there, too. Um, I'm a big ale guy, IPAs, uh, but... Since, uh, you know, I can't drink as many of those at one sitting as I used to, I'll drink pretty much any kind of beer. Love a good red wine, love uh, whiskey, like rum, uh, tequila. You know, it's really however the mood strikes me at the time, but I, my go-to is generally an IPA. Well, one thing we definitely do know, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to let you get in your jetty doing that, are they? No, 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 no. I, I don't think, yeah, I... I uh, I'd be too, you know, I'd be in, in there with my IPA, flying that thing around. It just wouldn't work out. See, we've gone back to civilization again. There you go. <laughs> there you we go, Peter. You, you paved the way nicely. So I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Peter, to plug Zone of the Enders, the second runner. <laughs> Anything else you've got coming up? Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, Konami's re-releasing Zone of the Enders, the second runner. I'm Dingo Egret. Please be kind to me and the other voice actors. Again, our hands were tied, or our tongues were tied to the script, and uh, all the awkward dialogue uh, wasn't our decision. But it's a fun, it's a fun thing. Um, I also got NBA 2K19 coming out on the PA announcer. That was done by uh, Visual Concepts. And uh, if you're interested, PeterBarto.com. You can see all the silly things I've done over the years. And on a final note, I obviously have sort of 
noticed it but not sort of mentioned it was the fact that you you've obviously done the voiceover for the NBA games. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been 14 years. I'm the public address announcer, so I'm the guy screaming the names. Uh, it's the hardest voice work that I do every year. It's fun. It's a it's a fun project, and uh, you know it's one of those things where every year uh, I keep thinking, okay, I'm not going to hear from them, and then I'll get an email, hey, are you available for a few sessions, you know, in spring? Like yes. So uh, they they hung me on at least one more. So we just wrapped uh, 2K19 not too long ago, and I think it's being released next week. Mm. Uh, so that's me screaming, you know, LeBron James and all those other names. So enjoy that. Is there a announcer who's done it as long as you have? Not that game. They've done it for 20, I think, uh, NBA 2K, I think is, I don't know the numbers, but it's, I think it's probably the top, you know, NBA basketball sports title in the world. Mm. Uh, they've been doing it about 20 years and I've done the, I've been the PA announcer 14 straight. There's been some announcers uh, for some of the some of the teams, like the guy in the Lakers, and some some of these guys have been doing it for a long. The PA's for a long time. It's hard work. It's a lot of screaming with character, but uh, you know, I wouldn't want to as a full time job. It would be very difficult. I mean, one of the questions I did have for you, Peter, is because you've done it for 14 years. Why do you think they keep asking you back? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheap. I think I'm uh, easy to direct. Part of it is, and I have to be quite honest, is remember, because I do it every year, they're using the same stuff that I did years ago. If those players are still playing, they don't have to re-record them. <laughs> uh, you put a new PA guy in there, you got to re-record everything. So I've kind of got an investment there. Now we come in, we'll record new names for the new, newer players or any new features they have. But uh, other than that, they can still use stuff that I recorded, you know, five, six, seven years ago. It's like, Michael Jordan. No, he doesn't do it anymore. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I got that going for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, Peter, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Don't know how the hell we did it. Matt, it's been a pleasure too. I really uh, enjoyed it. Being a voice actor is, is kind of hit or miss. I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, for those of you who are looking into it, it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. It's something you can do on the side if you need to, like I do. And games especially, there's there's a lot of fun. It's, it's a collaborative process. It's fun working with the other actors, and the, and it's it's a good time. Well, thanks very much for your time, Peter. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Bye bye. All right, bye bye.